hope the Yetis treated you well. Yeah, I love being shoved in a sack and tossed through a magic portal. Oh, good. That was my idea. Whoa! <laughs> The big four, all together. Santa Claus, Tooth Fairy, Sandman, and the Easter Kangaroo. The what? Mm. I'm a bunny. Hey everyone, I was lucky enough to get a pass this last weekend for an advanced screening of Rise of the Guardians, so I actually get to talk about a movie before it is officially released. I almost feel important now. Well, maybe not, but anyway. Uh... Rise of the Guardians. I didn't really know what to expect from this one. All I knew about it was that it was basically taking these mythical fairy tale characters, uh, Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, and the Sandman, and Jack Frost, and basically turning them into superheroes and forming a kind of almost a fairy tale Justice League or Avengers, if you will. And uh, that's really all I knew. I thought the idea was interesting, so it was enough to make me want to see the movie. I have not read any of the books that it's based on. I have not seen the short film that the author also did, so I have no knowledge of the source material whatsoever. I'm purely judging the film on its own merits. Uh, which it does have. <laughs> it, do it does have some merits. It's also lacking in some other areas, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the, uh, basically, the story behind this movie is uh, Pitch Black, also known as the Boogeyman, has returned to this world after being largely absent for a long time. They don't exactly say how long, but I get the impression it's probably a few centuries or so. And he is determined to cover the world in darkness and fear by taking out the Guardians. And he is going to do this by using his powers to stop the children from believing in them, because that's what the Guardians thrive on, the beliefs of children, and if they stop believing, they lose their powers. And the Guardians in question are uh, Santa Claus, otherwise known as North, the Easter Bunny, uh, usually just called Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, or Tooth, and the Sandman, or Sandy. And since they decide they need some extra help for this fight, they uh, bring a new member into their fold, which is Jack Frost. In terms of visual presentation, this is probably the best that DreamWorks Animation has ever been. It is probably on par with Wreck-It Ralph, and in some cases even surpasses it. It looks outstanding, just with the, you know, the vibrant colors and the attention to detail, and the, you know, incredible action sequences, and the battles between the Guardians and Pitch, and his army of demonic horses, which he, of course, calls nightmares. It's a pun. Get it? Waka waka? Okay. Um, but yeah, the, the level of detail in the various um, home bases of the Guardians, like the Easter Bunny's Warren, is, you know, of course, very earthy and features these, uh, almost these rock golems that guard the place that are, of course, shaped like giant eggs with these weird-looking faces on them. Um, the Tooth Fairy's Domain, which is this kind of this palace up in the sky and also on the interior, very rooted in nature. Um, Santa's Workshop, which is friggin' huge. I mean, this place just looks amazing. It is the best that Santa's Workshop has ever looked in any movie ever. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. This looks phenomenal. And he has an army of yetis for some reason. I'm not sure why, but whatever, we'll go with it. <laughs> uh, and uh, Sandman doesn't really have much of a domain, nor does Jack Frost. They're, they're just kind of there. Uh, Pitch's domain is pretty much the opposite of the you know, vibrant color and m magic of the Guardians. His is all very rooted in shadow, very dark, and several shades of gray. And no, I'm not making a Fifty Shades of Gray joke. This is a kid's movie, and that's wrong. We are better than that. Um, as far as the characters go, uh, Santa, or North, is played by Alec Baldwin, with a Russian accent for some reason. Uh, I guess in terms of geographic location, it makes sense for him to be Russian, even though I don't think the character has any Russian roots, but... Oh well, we'll go with it. And uh, Alec Baldwin really steals the show in this one. The character is awesome. He is a you know, very gentle, very kind-hearted. You get a sense he really enjoys his job, enjoys giving happiness to children, 
But at the same time, he is, in contrast to the short, fat man that he's often portrayed as, he is a big, burly Russian bastard that is built like a tank and wields dual swords. Most awesome Santa ever. I want to see a movie just about this guy. I'm serious. I would pay to see that. That would be awesome. Uh, the Easter Bunny is voiced by Hugh Jackman, uh, using his full-on Australian accent. And in fact, the character even seems very Australian as he wields uh, dual boomerangs, which uh, is also kind of weird. I'm not sure why the Easter Bunny would be Australian. Um, I guess rabbits live down under the ground, down under Australia. Hugh Jackman, there we go. I, I totally pulled that out of my ass just now. I don't know if that's what they were thinking, but I guess it works. Um, and he's kind of the asshole of the group in a way. He's a, you know, not that he's a bad guy. He's just a, you know, very set in his ways, very much does not like being taken out of his elements, very no-nonsense kind of guy. Um, there's the Tooth Fairy, who is actually very hummingbird-like, both in terms of her appearance and also her personality. She is, you know, very energetic, very excitable, very hyperactive, pretty much on a permanent caffeine high, just bouncing all over the place. Um, and she is voiced by Ella Fisher, who also does a fantastic job. Uh, the Sandman does not have a voice, because he is a mute. Uh, he instead communicates by taking his magical sand and forming it into various symbols and basically playing a never-ending game of Pictionary often to hilarious results when people keep misinterpreting what he's trying to say. Um, he also uh, is probably the most creative of the group in that he can take his magical sand and form pretty much anything he wants, including these two huge friggin' whips that he uses in battle, uh, including a very nicely done fight scene with him and the boogeyman, who is kind of the anti-sandman. Um, his He also uses a magical sand of sorts, but it's Instead of being this, like, glowing golden type sand that Sandy uses, his is, much like the rest of his domain, very black. And I've heard some people compare him to Voldemort, and yeah, he does look very similar to Voldemort. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to call it a complete ripoff. It, you know, similar in appearance, but that didn't really bother me. And he is voiced by Jude Law, and man, Jude Law can be creepy if he wants to. This... He did a very good job with the Sandman. Just very dark, brooding, and just dripping with pure evil. It was very nicely done. Um, he, he tries to steal the show from Alec Baldwin. Doesn't quite do it, but he comes close. Um, and then there's one character left. And that is Jack Frost. I really don't know what to say about him. And that's where the movie kind of stumbles a bit, because the movie is mainly about Jack Frost. This is his story. It's how he, you know, stops being just a run-of-the-mill fairy tale creature and actually becomes someone important. He becomes a guardian, someone people believe in. And it's all about him rising up and finding out why he was meant to be a guardian and accepting that role and really coming into his own, and it just isn't handled very well because this character has very little personality at all, especially compared to his larger-than-life comrades, you know, I mean, all of these other characters are just very memorable and vibrant and really well-defined, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, uh, the Star Wars character test that Red Letter Media did, you know, describe this character without using their appearance, uh, what their costume looks like, or their profession, or their role in the movie. He likes no, no profession. No, that doesn't work. Um, yeah, I have nothing. I really don't. Uh, he's, reluctant at first to become a guardian. That's really all I got. Yeah, he's just not a very well-defined character, and that's what really prevents this movie from being great. Um, not that I think it's a bad movie. It's not. Absolutely not. It's, it's still a very good movie, and 
I think a lot of people who see this movie will enjoy it, but I don't, if DreamWorks was hoping to create a new holiday classic, I could be completely wrong, but I think they're going to be disappointed because I, it's just, while it's, you know, visually breathtaking and has some great performances and it still has its charming moments here and there and also its moments of humor, which hit more often than miss, it's just not all that memorable because it focuses on a very unmemorable character. So that, that's what's really keeping it from going into greatness. Um, now, as for whether I would recommend the movie, I suppose it's... Th there are worse ways to spend 90 minutes, that's for sure. Um, it might be worth seeing just for the visuals alone. And speaking of the visuals, usually whenever I see a movie that is presented in 3D, like the screening was, it was shown in 3D, usually I end up saying, yeah, the 3D looked pretty, but honestly, if you see it in 2D, you're not missing anything. That is not the case here. Unless you have an aversion to 3D, this is actually worth spending the extra money on the 3D admission. It really is. This 3D adds a whole nother layer to the visual presentation. And especially if you have small children, I think they will eat it up. You'll see a lot of them going like this at the screen a couple of times, like I saw several kids in my theater doing. Um, they will definitely get a kick out of it. Um, and really, I think small children are going to enjoy this movie a lot more than adults will. And probably more so than older children as well. Um, but there's still something to like in there. I mean, even just, you know, the visuals alone, it's very easy to get lost in that. And, you know, it's, it's still worth the price of admission, I think. It's just, I wouldn't count on this becoming a classic because it does have some, a few stumbling points and they really bring it down. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh, there was one more thing that, didn't really make much sense to me. Um, the entire purpose of uh, Pitch stopping the children from believing in the Guardians is when they stop believing, they lose their powers. And as he slowly starts to succeed throughout the movie, that actually happens. They do start to weaken a bit. They uh, start to lose their magical gifts. Jack Frost is completely unaffected by this. Why? You know, how come he isn't reliant on beliefs and he's just, you know, he has his powers there no matter what. His powers are dependent on his almighty plus four magical stick of frost storm or whatever it is. I, maybe the books explain that better, but that, that was kind of weird. That's, didn't make much sense. It's, it's a minor complaint, I guess, because it, it doesn't hurt the story as much as Jack's blandness hurts the story, but, uh, yeah, so there was that, but, yeah, so that, that's Rise of the Guardians. It's a, not an instant classic, in my opinion, but you could do a lot worse. Uh, that's about it. My next episode of Cinematic Excrement should be coming out very soon. Um, it's almost done. I just have to put the finishing touches on it. There's a couple of things I want to re-record real quick, but... Yeah, it should be up in a couple of days, hopefully before Thanksgiving. If not before, then immediately afterwards. And that's about it, so I will see y'all later. You hold the record.